Hello everybody, welcome back. I'm gonna go this with me is Igorix, the Lord. bastard. Um yeah, so here we are. Weird we after beating the Ptolemies in the end of our last part. We are beginning in the beginning of what I like to call our first Syrian war. As I said, I think in the last part, uh, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies engaged in many wars over this particular area that we're in, which is called Coele Syria, and they're called Syrian Wars, and does someone just call it the Syrian War now? But here we have uh, our own little battle. Our king, Seleucus, or Antiochus I, versus King Ptolemy. If anyone's wondering where Icarix is, don't worry, I'm here. I just wanted to give Kinogusis the chance to speak because I realized that I've always been talking over him in the intro, so I wanted to give him the chance to speak this time How around. How considerate You're of you. Welcome. Aren't I, aren't I just the most generous person alive? Yeah, so here we have our Silesian Peltasts as our ranged core. We have our Silver Shields. We have our Galatian Spearmen. Of course, we have our Bronze Shield Pikes also. We have our melee infantry, which be our Greeks at Uzonoi, and our Galatians. Our general. So, Kinogusis, you were telling me that this new DLC is coming out eventually. Oh, yes. You want to share with the audience? Uh, for those into the Warhammer series, the, as of today, the, the trailer for the Shadows of Change DLC to Warhammer 3 has come out. I'm sure most people are already aware. So we've learned about the new Legendary Lord characters and all that stuff. Also the controversy over the pricing. Uh, so yeah, don't want to delve too much into it because I think this battle is a little bit significant to be, talk to be talking about. So yeah. But yeah, so we are facing the Ptolemaic, uh, well I like to call the Royal Army because this is King Ptolemy II, his army. Uh, so well, we have the stragglers from the previous enemy army we fought so i'm sending antiochus down to take chase on some of the reinforcing cavalry along with having my hippies unit doing the same thing um i won't delve probably too much into this at the moment but this battle i would say was a bit disastrous i got very careless although it was a victory. It came with some. Yes, it's with, with one of those close calls you were talking about earlier, weren't you? Probably less a close call. I don't know how much it was a close call, but certainly there were some losses that were kind of significant. Uh, we'll see now throughout the battle. But so we are deploying our infantry to counter their infantry. Their melee troops are the Thracian cleric folksmen. Uh, versus my Uzonoi. But yeah, so our Hitaira is attacking the Mizian cavalry. Which obviously going to go well for us. Yeah, and so the clash begins. Arrows away there. Uh huh. Yep. Tell me good, clear, good, Rapanai. Infantry against infantry. Yeah. Um, and we have our cavalry there chasing their archers. The Egyptian bowmen. No, oh, I didn't know Egyptians were part of this army. Obviously there would be. The Ptolemies ruled Egypt. Oh yeah, good point. I guess because I'm often Here talking I about the Ptolemies, sports. but that's because they were the people that ruled Egypt at this time. Here I am spouting off bullshit again, as usual. You're just confused. I suppose you're not very familiar with this time period. But yeah, so King... That's right, I'm very... That's, it's right. I'm, that's right. I'm very uneducated. So our Galatians are fighting Galatians as Ptolemy is coming down with his bodyguard. The Ile Basilike, a royal squadron. So it's said to have some king-on-king -king action. 
in this battle. <laughs> and we've pinned him between our two cavalry units. Yeah, I put quite a bit. It's not exactly between a rock and a hard place. I'd say it's in between two armies and a narrow opening. Yeah. But thus far, the battle is going well since we're mainly just in this small scale skirmish. Ooh. Sorry, I actually disconnected my headphone lead there. <laughs> sure happens to the best of us. Yeah, I was reaching for my water bottle. But yeah. So I think I decide, yeah, to pull out my Hippes unit so it's just Antiochus versus Ptolemy. You know, so I wanted just to have that bodyguard and bodyguard action for a bit of. I suppose it's kind of fun in its own spectacle. It didn't go down quite the way you expected. Pretty much, but we'll see what happens. Well, the infantry over there is still going at it. It won't let up. Oh, yeah, well, in fairness, you are having comparable quality of infantry against each other. What kind of infantry are they, actually? Well, our Galatians are fighting Galatian mercenary spearmen. Galatians against Galatians, brother against brother. And our Uzonoi swords are up against the Thracian infantry. Yeah, so we are winning the fight against Ptolemy here, but we're still taking quite the casualties. Is this more of a Pyrrhic victory than anything else? Well, a Pyrrhic victory is more reference to the losses you take. I suppose you could look at it that way. Just in that. Because, I mean, like, we win the battle, but we just take heavy losses in the midst of it. Well, I think it. our we overall casualties in the battle were not too high. It's just what happened here. Uh, so, basically, in my carelessness, I basically let Antiochus get killed. Oh, shit. Because I just wanted to have that bodyguard and bodyguard action. See? See, can you this? This is what happens when you have bodyguard and bodyguard action. Up the top of one. They're more pretty. But yeah. This is where I decided to send in my hip haze to help just, you know, salvage the situation. Sure, you've lost Antiochus. What's there to salvage? That is true in some ways, but we can continue the battle without him. Sure, their morale may be low, but they're not. They're gonna die trying at the very least. Morale, not morale. 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 <laughs> morale. Their morale may be low, but they're gonna die trying. But yeah, at this point now, Ptolemy is dead. Yeah. If I'm going down, then you're going down with We also bitch. here have our Syrian elephants. Well, thank fucking Christ. It's about time they bloody showed up. We finally got access to our Syrians. These are our Tarantines. And yeah. Yeah, so they're already kind of taking a slight penalty to the morale for the death of our general. As you see, I deployed my Argoraspides, or Silver Shields, to the right. I tried to do that. They're standing there going, God almighty, what, what's become of us? We lost Antiochus, our general, it's just, oh my god, it's a shitty day all around. I don't know if I want to fight anymore. I, I, I've lost the will. Well, we're still carrying on, and we're doing pretty well. Our cavalry's clashing with their cavalry. Because war doesn't care for feelings, it only cares about bloodshed and efficiency. In some ways you could say that, perhaps. <laughs> what else is the game called? Total War. Yes. Yes. Because the totality of war trumps emotions and feelings. Yeah, the Ptolemy cavalry is mostly just Thracians. You know. 
I know there was discussion in the Discord about the Thracian infantry of the Ptolemies. What did it concern? Basically, once you reach the rarest forms, they're kind of redundant. Because... Why is that? You see, well, they're 300 strong class 2 units. But when you... Mm -hmm. And they're your main melee infantry until you get your Thraos reforms. And when you get to Thraos reforms, you get your equivalent of Thraos swords. And that makes the Thracians kind of redundant because there's not really much value for them. So... So my... Sure, you can always disband them and get yourself better forces in the meantime, well, like, can't you? Your Thrao swords are basically about as good, or well, they're slightly different. The stats aren't the exact same in maze, but generally there's there's not much point in having the Thracian unit if you get this other kind of more cheaper unit. So we got our pike on pike action. So I think one idea is maybe to have something happen, like maybe they can get retrained into some other sturdier unit in Thrales Reforms as an idea. Um, to make them kind of more worth having later in the game, because it kind of just, there's no point in having them when you get to Thrales Reforms. So along those lines was a discussion. Because see, for the Seleucids, the Uzonoi sword you need to become Thrael swords when you get to Thrael's reforms. So that's not an issue for them. Yep. So infantry's holding well. It's the battle of the big sticks. Which stick is which stick is longer? But there's also some hoplites there that our infantry is engaging. And the Syrian elephants are just standing there all useless, like just... You know, we, we, don't need to, we don't need to engage, I mean like, these guys are getting all this fun. Well evidently I haven't given you the orders to engage, but I'm also trying to be careful with them. Fuck careful! It's a total, it's a total war, man! Yes, but you still it's have to be war. careful about your losses. We've already we've already lost Antiochus. It doesn't even, how, doesn't, how much more? Because I still have the rest of the army. The army isn't gone just because Antiochus is gone. But our elephants have moved in, attacking enemy troops. Oh bloody time! Yeah. I guess they. I guess those guys have the biggest sticks. Well, I suppose they. Both sides would have been competing with each other for the length of their sericai. Mm -hmm. Because you know, if one side is getting longer, ones you're going to want to outbeat them with even longer ones. So then it got. Yes, because size is really important. Size is really important for these guys. I know what you're referring to, but <laughs> I couldn't resist. I know. But the size of a Sarissa was kind of important. Though it got to the point where they got really long and that was too unwieldy, so they shortened them down. Yeah, sure, of course it was. And uh yeah. So the pikes of like Alexander and Philip were shorter than these. Probably close to three meters in length. Maybe four. But yeah. Yeah, moving our elephants in. So we're using the Hellenic HD mod here, and one of the unfortunate problems is there are a couple of missing textures, particularly on say some of the archers on the elephants. You'll notice, you may notice that there's one or two that will be missing arms. Uh, not from this angle, they all seem to be... Their arms all seem to be intact from this angle. That's yeah, because they're not close in and off. Well, we've won the battle, we're now in the routing phase. But at what cost? Arcane. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to be able to sleep tonight. It's 
it's, it's just such a huge loss. Fortunately, his son Antiochus II is of age to just immediately take over. Oh, oh okay then. Well, that's. I've completely forgotten all about Antiochus' death. I mean, like, his son can clean all this shit up, you know? So, I mean, like, I guess we can just move on with our day. It's still not actually great to have your faction die, and it causes some political problems. Especially as Antiochus II was considered a disdained faction leader according to the game's politics system. Which is very RNG. I think it's just kind of random for the most part. Yeah. Sure, it'd be very, it'd be a very alien concept not to have any sort of political intrigue at this point with political backstabbing or uh, secret alliances or anything like that. The has definitely had a lot of that, those sorts of problems. I'm sure, it was a, I'm sure it was a foreign concept for these guys not to have any of that. To some extent, like, certainly as time went on there was a lot more problems that began to occur. And interdynastic feuding. Sure, even Antiochus had to put to death one of his sons, Antiochus the First. He had at least two sons that I remember. You, you had Seleucus and Antiochus. And we don't know exactly why, but Seleucus was put to death. It's thought that he might have either, he was I think a joint king, because something that Seleucus I did was that he made his son Antiochus, this is Antiochus I, joint king, once he was old enough. This gave Antiochus enough experience in ruling and managing, you know, which was very useful. So it meant when Seleucus was assassinated by Ptolemy Keronos, Whilst there was some instability, it meant Antiochus knew what to do, knew how to rule, he had experience, and it meant the transition was relatively smooth. But anyway, so Antiochus I uh, has, again, as I say, two sons, one named Seleucus and a younger son named Antiochus. And Seleucus is put to death. So Seleucus, I think, was a joint king, so it's thought he may have gotten impatient and may have plotted to just become the king. But we don't know for sure. Whatever happened, it seems that Antiochus had to put him to death, and so he did. And therefore, Antiochus' second son, Antiochus, became the joint king and then Antiochus II. Well, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty shitty day or not. Yeah. But yeah, and I think even then, I don't remember. it gets a little fuzzy for me after this point. I said that you get lots of tension, a lot of problems then. Uh, I think maybe from Antiochus II's children. I know there's an Antiochus Hierax who took over Asia Minor and was a, a nuisance to his brother. It might have been Seleucus II. Eventually, like, Many Seleucid, a few of the Seleucid kings start dying one after another in different ways, and then we get to Antiochus the Third, who I think was the great grandson. I think Antiochus the Third was the grandson of Antiochus the First, which meant he would have been a son of Antiochus the Second, if my memory is correct. And Antiochus III is probably among the best kings the Seleucids had. What exactly did he accomplish? He, I think, he brought the Seleucid Empire. Well, one, he took you when he took the throne. The Seleucid Empire was crumbling, basically. Mm -hmm. There was, there was a rebellion by a, a general called Molon, and just a lot of problems and some conflicts. I think within the advisors and stuff so he was about 19 or 20 when he sends the throne of a pretty unstable if you will or destabilizing kingdom and he's not only able to kind of get the kingdom back into order 
but he brings it to its greatest territorial extent. He... After he... After he dealt with his rebellions and, and internal issues, he then embarked on a Syrian war, and whilst he lost the war, he was very lucky that I think he got off pretty lightly. And... It's... Um, I'm trying to think now. And so, after that, he goes off. He he goes on an expedition to the east to try and bring the eastern satrapies back under heel. And this puts him against the Parthians. Um, and he... Uh, he succeeds more mostly, I think, in getting those eastern regions under control. You said he got off lucky, in the, even though he lost the war. What exactly did he get lucky for, exactly? That the terms were not too bad. I don't remember the specifics, but in the sense that the terms of the peace agreement were not as bad as they could be. But they could have been better. Well, obviously, like, the fact that he was on the losing end, so he would have had to agree to some form of concessions. But they were not too heavy. Although, again, I don't remember the specifics. Because a rebellion, there were rebellions and problems that broke out on the Ptolemy side. So Ptolemy VI had a lot of issues to contend with. Um, but yeah. Anyways, what's this battle all about? Well, we are attacking... Uh, I think this is Tyre. Turos. 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 I'm not going to pronounce it correctly. Basically, I'm not saying yeah. shh. I'm doing more like a, a sort of a, like this retracted S. Shh. Turos. Because that's how you'd say it probably in Greek. Spelt in oh. our Latin letters T Y R O S. In Greek, those were tau, upsilon, uh, rho, uh, omicron, and sigma. So. Well, I'm not even gonna. I'm not even gonna try because I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna keep failing, man. So I'm. Just so basically, keep, keep doing the well, you, so you basically just go tu because the upsilon is like this u sound. Tu, rho, sh, yeah. Duros will be how it's been pronounced. Duros. Uh, and that's how they probably would have pronounced what we call Tyre. So we're attacking the Ptolemaic garrison. Well, pretty bloody effective. Well, obviously, yeah. It's not a super strong garrison. The Greek garrisons are pretty solid. You know, but yes. And we have our Syrian elephants in this army. Here we have them actually doing shit this time around instead of just waiting off on the sidelines. I know you have to order them around and everything, but all the same, it's nice to know they're not just flailing their feet around on the sidelines waiting for orders. So yeah, and our, our ranged force this time consists of archers, a mixture of Syrian and Cretan archers. If you had to choose between the two, then who would you pick? Between Syrian and Cretans? Between the two archers. Well, they're both good at different things. They're not the same. Syrian archers have pretty decent range, pretty good armor, and decent enough damage. Cretans have shields, terrible range, but very impressive damage and rate of fire. I don't know, I'd probably go with the Syrian elephants, because I feel like I'm with archers, archers, range is more important. Yeah, I'm talking about the archers, between Cretan and Syrian archers. No, but what I mean is, like, I would, if I had to choose between the two of them, I would probably go... I would probably pick the Syrian archers, because I feel like with archery, range is a lot... Seeing as how their archery range is a lot more... Well, yes, if you want to look at it that way, but the thing is, it's about how you use them. Oh, I completely Cretans understand are that. shielded, but also the fact that what you could do to really make them effective again, their damage is very impressive. 
is that you could maneuver them to hit an enemy's vulnerable spot and they could do really good damage. So it's a matter of how they're used and Cretans are especially good in that and them having shields means if they are in a skirmish they can at least be a bit better protected. So you know it, it, it's less about the power of the range and more about other factors. No, what archers I suppose you do have a point there. Know what archers have the best range? Which ones? Indian longbowmen. Really? Yes, Mari and longbowmen. They have the best range of any archer. Um, and Cretans have the worst range of any archer. But Cretans... Are we able to get Indian archers in this campaign? I can get Indian longbowmen, but they're not—they're like the weaker levy types, with still decent range. I can get mercenary longbowmen with the in very impressive range, but that's all I can get in this campaign. Still, it's better than. Oh yeah, than oh yeah. You know? I can get so I can get as mercenaries. I can get the longbow, the really good ones. I can get some decent levy types with. A, okay range. About 175 is a pretty good range, but still. But, uh, Rome can get some really good arch- can pretty get some pretty nifty archer units. Mostly because you've got the, um, what were they called? Cohors Sagittariorum Hamiorum Miliaria. Which is basically... So, it's a cohort of archers from, I think it's Hama or something like that, Hamas, a city in Syria. But they're basically like almost double the size of a normal unit of archers. So most range units are numbered at about 175. Do you know what these dudes are numbered at? No. 320. Jesus. So you can only get one of them. Only one? Yeah, you can only get one. Almighty. They're part of Rome's auxiliaries, and usually the Miliaria types you can only get one of. Now, most of them are like double sized spear infantry. So the cohorts Hispanora Miliaria is 400 spearmen. I guess it's something. Oh yeah, it's still know. like you can get some other sword units like that. You can get the Cohors Batawarum Miliaria, which is basically four hundred swordsmen. You know. Basically the size of a first cohort. Yep, we have a Galatian levy spearmen. And Tarantin cavalry fighting some Ptolemaic troops there. Our phalanx is holding off a lot of the enemy infantry. The native militia, I believe, are trying to get another angle on them. Well, the ones running to the be... side are, are retreating. They're routing. Ah. They're running they're run for the hills. They're keeping off. Yeah, the Mackinoy. I think Maki might refer to the Egyptians when enlisted and they were called Maki Moy. Whereas like your Greek setter units are called Klerukoi. Because with the Ptolemies, like the Seleucids, operate on kind of a system of you get land in exchange for military service for a lot of these settlers. A lot of them are Greek, but they weren't always Greek. You had Galatians, you had uh, Thracians, are notable examples. Yep. Yeah. And it's another victory for us. So we're very good at this at this point. It was downloaded, but we both. Yeah. 
Yeah, as of uh, the present recording of the campaign, the present stage of the campaign, we're five turns away from Thorax reforms. Oh, we're getting close. Yeah, it'd be nice when we get to that stage. A lot of uh, upgrades. What kind of upgrades can we expect again? Our pike men, the bronze and silver shields become thorax. Bronze and silver shield pikes. We get access to the silver shield swords men. The kind of royal guard spears. Uh, the Agama and Hatiro units get upgraded. With the Agama effectively turning into cataphracts. We get a, a unit of Hellenic cataphracts. We get the Epilectoi. Uh, kind of heavy uh, Thessalian Lancer types. We get our Hippes get upgraded to the Politikoi, a bit of a sturdier cab unit. We can recruit Galatian Thorax Swords from Galatia. And that's all I can think of on top of my head. I think that's about the extent of it. Ready for battle. Shall we occupy? And that's that's Tyrosh in our hands. Did I say it right no, this time? No, did not. Shit. Tyros. Tyros. Close. Just that the but S. No cigar. The S is be a bit well, more like a retracted S sound. Something in Close between. No cigar. Something between that s and sh. Ready for orders. To rosh. To rosh. To rosh. To rosh. To rosh. Sh. That sound. It's a more retracted. <laughs> I s. give up. It's it's kind of. Although you didn't do Spanish, it's what they do in Spanish. Uh, oh, we're building on fortifications and. Uh, or was it again? <laughs> I didn't probably see there. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but yeah, so the problem is Yehuda is called Yehuda here. But it's also called Koyla Syria. I am yours to command. But yeah, we can get a uh, Jewish Thoreau Poroi. In this province, in Thoreau's reforms. What are those guys like? Well, the Thoreau's the Thoreau's spearmen, pretty solid ones, and they're Jewish. I think they're based we off of, uh, in part, well, I think well, it was known that Jews could fight well in a Hellenistic part. style, but there's um, in Dara Europos, or Dura Europos. In Syria, I think it was, there's like uh, the remains of a synagogue. Has a bunch of paintings on it, and one of it is meant to be depicting the crossing of the Red Sea. I think it's the Red Sea. Um, oh, that's nice. And it seems to depict the the Jews with these oval shields. Yeah. It's pretty interesting to see, and that's I think probably what the DEI devs got inspired by. Well, it's a pretty decent inspiration. Oh yeah. Again, Tureus was a type of shield, it's the oval shield. And it's a Greek word for the kind of oval shield. And it was... So is that like the main inspiration? Um, yeah, because the, the whole thing is that uh, it was a popular shield in the later Hellenistic period. It was quite popular. You know, because it's uh, very handy, be very handy to use. Pretty lightweight and maneuverable. But yeah, we'll see more of it when we get to the Terrell's reforms. But yeah, it's uh, quite a prevalent shield. I've talked about it before. Managed to wound the enemy general there. In the army of Taz Justice. Oh, 
attacking from attacking from all sides. Mm -hmm. Who are we attacking there? The I can't pr I can't pronounce that. What does that say? Taz Justice. Uh, we're attacking the Tomoloi. Tolomoyoi. Tolomoyoi. But Tolomoyoi. But Tolomoyoi. Did I get it? I think it's Ptolemyoi. Basically, the Ptolemies. <laughs> so it's the Ptolemies. So who else would it be at this point? Well, yeah, it's just the Greek for Ptolemies is Ptolemyoi. As far as I know, Pi and Tau would have been pronounced as Pi and Tau. So Ptolemyoi. Rather than. Do any of those Syrian elephants back there have the same kind of glitches you were mentioning? I think earlier? it happens all of them. It's it's a spe seems like it's a specific type of body armor that's causing the issue. Where they got missing arms. What if we try changing out the body armor, or is it like a or is it like a fixed body armor that I could be potentially changed? change it around, but that would require going into the assembly kit and trying to transfer all the assets. It's a pain in the ass, and it'd be yeah, I a problem. And if I, I, I wouldn't be too comfortable trying to do all that stuff myself. The mod dev is aware of these issues, and I think is trying to work on it. But I think he's it, it'll be released sometime this month in August. Sure, they've already got enough on their plate with all. They've already got enough on their plate anyway, so I suppose we shouldn't be asking too much. And uh, this is a different person from the DEI team. This is not anything to do DEI. It's just a separate mod I'm using. That is DEI compatible. Should be. It works generally, but yeah. Yeah, we have the Ptolemaic slingers against our archers. Cutting them down like butchers in a barn. Oh yeah, because they don't have shields. They have, like no armor. Why would they go in without any armor or shields? Because they're light ranged troops. What good are they for exactly? Ranged warfare, skirmishing. Because anyways, they're not that great of a unit anyways. So they're basically just cannon fodder. Would there be a cheap? Uh, a cheap slinger unit. So slingers can be pretty deadly if used well. Uh huh. Yeah, I think those are Arabian spearmen. Shields. Oh yeah, big oval shields. Yeah. Oh, here's our phalanx formation now, ready to. Yeah, well they've taken back. some casualties from the skirmish. They're engaging, but it wasn't at a great moment. Here we go. Oh, well. Syrian elephants are there to cut off the cavalry. Yeah, we have regulations fighting. Carrying spearmen. I've never noticed those symbols on the shields before, actually. It's shields would have been painted with a variety of symbols on them. Was that actually something they did back in the old days? They definitely would have. Couldn't see why not. Do you want your, if you're going to battle, do you want a plain old shield or do you want to have something on it? Well, obviously you want to have something on it. Well, I don't know, the, the design of them, they look like some, they look more like paintings than shields. Well, you'd be painting on a shield. 
Really? Obviously. Why wouldn't you? Well, I'm not disagreeing. Like, would it get in the way of the, fun the practical function of a shield? No, it wouldn't. And you probably like to have some style. You know? Yeah, I know. Like, look at how those colourful shields are. I talked before about how Greek uh, uh, Aspides, you know, the hoplite shield, those were painted, usually painted. It was one of the things 300, I think 300 ever depicted was that their shields are bloody painted on, you know. Again, 300 is, is, is kind of really just fantasy. You know, I actually don't know how much do people take what it says at face value. Well, I don't think a lot of people will have read the comics before watching the movie. I think to some extent people, yeah, I do have a feeling that maybe not everybody knows it's based off of a comic. So it's based off a com it's a comic adaptation that is a very loose, more fantasized telling of a story that we have in Herodotus. So I think Herodotus is the main source for, for the Battle of Thermopylae. But yeah, um... But it is one of those, like, very immortalized things, and people do remember that event. It's quite a famous event, I suppose, the Greco-Persian War. Yeah, but I think a lot more people remember it because it was shown in the movie rather than, yes. like, the comic adaptation. Like, people probably don't really understand why Persia invaded Greece in the first place. It was kind of out of revenge on Athens. You see... Around the western coast of Turkey, that region is kind of called Ionia. And there were Greek colonies there, and they revolted against Persian rule. And they had connections to Athens, so they, they called on Athens for help. And Athens obliged. They proceeded to try and help. And... What happened was uh, the the Persians were pissed, and they wanted revenge. I think it was in the reign of Darius the First. I think Xerxes, his father, they tried one invasion, led to the Battle of Marathon, and the Greeks won. I think they attacked before the Persians could be properly ready. If my memory is correct. And so they wanted revenge. They wanted to still pay Athens back. So Darius' son Xerxes mustered a very large army and went into Greece. And the Spartans decided to lead a group. Again, there were several thousand additional Greeks from other city-states. It wasn't just the 300 Spartans. Who... See, Thermopylae is a pretty narrow valley so it was ideal to just be a good choke point to hold the Persians for some time to buy time for people of Athens to evacuate and in that they largely succeeded now I think most of those reinforcing Greeks left before the final battle because they feared for their homes because the Persians found a way around But I think 1,000 other Greeks from whatever state it was chose to stay behind, so far as I understand, chose to stay behind and died alongside the Spartans. But I think that's enough for now. Unfortunately, we are nearing the end. A box. Alright, well, at the same time, be sure to leave a comment, like, and subscribe, and we will see you all soon. Indeed. Thanks for watching.